Good morning. Wonderful to have you with us this morning. Wonderful to have you at home with us as well this morning. Today, we're about the midway point through the journey to Calvary's cross this Lenten season, our third midweek service. May the Lord bless us as we gather in his name. It is also a communion worship service this morning. May the Lord bless our worship. And once again, it's good to have Margaret back behind the piano for the first time for a full service since her accident. So may the Lord bless your service this morning as well. We open up with the singing of Drawn to the Cross, hymn 808. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins unto the Lord. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord 
for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the well being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and to do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The Lord speaks to us through his word this morning, first of all, from the Old Testament lesson that's taken from the book of Exodus. We read from the 20th chapter, beginning with the first verse. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm of the day is Psalm 19. The organist will play through the refrain and the psalm tone, and then we will sing Psalm 19.
epistle this morning for the third Sunday in the season of Lent is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. We read from the first chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. <clears throat> for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sing the gospel acclamation. Let's rise with the gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel is recorded in John, the second chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, o Christ. Christ. You may be seated. We continue with our sermon hymn, hymn 529, In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text this morning for our consideration taken from the book of Exodus. We read from the second chapter beginning with the 11th verse. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian being a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. This is God's word. Congregation may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, when Moses had grown, two ways of looking at that, the more obvious is that he was now mature and old enough to go out and do things on his own. The learning period of his life was behind him. The other thing could be said when he had grown now to a position of authority and power and rank um, amongst the Egyptians and in the Egyptian court and such like that. Whatever, it was probably at about the age 40 as we read in the book of Acts that all these things in our text this morning take place. But it begs, or something that begs a question right off the bat is, why would Moses want to give up the good life? Why would he want to leave the palace and the palace intrigue and the riches and everything that goes together with, with the royalty and go out to what he referred to as his people? There is obviously in the mind of Moses that God had set him apart for something and that he did have that belief in God and that God had a purpose for him. Whether or not he viewed himself as being the deliverer of his people one could make the argument that perhaps he did. But many of you, as you're now growing and your, your careers are ahead of you, you're thinking of high school and college, and then after college, what am I going to do with my life? And um, it's such an easy thing to get caught up in, in the fast life and the glitter of everything. Uh, I can't wait to get out of this small town, Iowa, and get into the big city and there just really enjoy all the things that life have to offer. Moses was not of that opinion, was he? It had come to Moses' realization that this, this palace, this royalty, this, this wealth, this wasn't me. This isn't what God wants for me. There has to be something different. For many of us, some of us, a few of us, perhaps we've come to that realization too. Yeah, we were teenagers, we were young adults, we did a lot of wild and crazy things. And all of a sudden it dawns on you, this isn't me. This isn't what God wants for me. I want to do something that serves my Lord. I want to do something that, that is, is beneficial, that profits not just me and not just my selfish and di desires and such. And Moses was probably at that point where he realized, he looked around, I see my people out there, they're suffering. They're being abused. And here I am living like this. This is not what God wants. So, he takes it upon himself to be Israel's deliverer. And how'd that work out? He tries to deliver one person. He kills someone in the meantime, buries the body, and the next day people know about it. And so the great deliverer didn't do very well after the first attempt to be a deliverer. But usually is the case when we strike out on our own and want to do things our own way and, don't, and aren't patient enough to let God 
direct our path and guide our way. But it's interesting, as, as you read the text here, as Moses saw this Egyptian striking and beating this Hebrew, he was angry. And, and so what does he do? It, our, our text captures it. He sees this happening. He looks one way. He looks the other way. And he goes and he kills the Egyptian. Whenever we are doing something we should not be doing, chances are you look one way and the other way to see if anyone is watching. If you are doing something in your room and you hear your parents just outside the door, you either slam shut your computer or your book or whatever and throw it underneath the pillow because you don't want them to see what you're reading or what you are doing. On the other hand, if what I was doing was perfectly in keeping what the Lord would want me to do, there wouldn't be any concern about looking one way or another because we'd know that was what the Lord wanted us to do. So a simple rule, if I have to look one way or another to see if anybody's watching me, I probably shouldn't be doing the things that I'm doing. And so Moses here, filled with, with this idea that it was not right, and then he kills the person. And so what does he do? He takes the body and buries it. Moses, 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 hiding our sin does not remove it. The conscience will continue to bother. You'll still have to deal with you, what you did. Confession and repentance are always what helps us to deal with sin and then to receive the Lord's absolution. So he comes back the next day. And he sees two Hebrews fighting. He breaks up the fight and he chastises the one who was in the wrong. And, and what, 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 what do they say? Who are you to be our judge? We don't want anything to do with you. Boy, talk about deflating the ego in a hurry. Don't you know who I am? I was raised in the Egyptian court. I've got connections. I've got an in there. And you don't want anything to do with me? Isn't it the same language that many people use today? The Christian faith, believing in Jesus as our Savior from sin. I don't want anyone to judge me. I don't want the Lord judging me. As a matter of fact, I don't want the Lord. I don't want to follow him. How often do we say it? The worst things in life is when the Lord says, okay, have it your way. And so here they are, and here's Moses. He came and thought, I'm going to really help these people. And all of a sudden he realizes, I'm not going to be able to help them. Spiritual leadership is always God-ordained. It is never self-assumed. Moses jumps into this situation and assumes that he is going to be Israel's deliverer. And God never told him that. God never directed him in that path. And yet, they've suffered long enough. It's time for something to happen here. And God's not doing anything about it, so I'm going to do something about it. How many of the times that we were just so impatient in our life, we wouldn't let God be God, we rushed into something without really thinking it all the way through, and we realized after the fact it didn't turn out all that well. And so, you, you, you have to feel a little bit for Moses here. You know, talk about going from a somebody to a nobody in just a matter of a, a day. And so now he, he flees to Egypt, or flees from Egypt to Midian, from being sort of like on the top of the world practically, now to going and herding sheep out in nowhere, in the hills and the rocky regions of, of Midian. It wasn't God's time for Moses 
to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Timing is everything in life. God's timing. You know, there, there may be that person that we get into a religious discussion with, and it turns into practically a debate. And then it's like, I've got to defend what I believe and, and at all costs and such like that. Timing is everything. Sometimes it takes time for a person to understand, for the Holy Spirit to work in a person's life. Sometimes that person needs some kind of setback or tragedy or misfortune to happen in their life where they realize they have a real need for the Lord. And so if we get frustrated with our efforts of reaching out or doing evangelism work or witnessing to someone, it just doesn't seem to be going very fast. Put it in God's hands. You've done what God wanted you to do and trust in Him. We don't have to force the issue. We don't have to, to speed things along. God doesn't need our help in that regard. Moses thought he was ready. He's, he's ready to go. I'm, I'm ready to help my people. I see what's this mistreatment that they're receiving. No longer does he feel that way. And probably the last lesson that, and there's many lessons that we can learn from this text, but maybe the last lesson for this morning is I'm rather certain as Moses is making that journey from Egypt to Midian, he must have felt as though he was the worst loser in life. I have not only made a fool of myself, I have failed my people, I have failed my God, I am worthless. What is, what, what is my life? I, I lived 40 years in the lap of luxury and I tried to do something that was right and I got slapped down, so to speak, and here I am. Here I am. What does the Lord want with me? I'm a loser. I'm a failure. Isn't it wonderful to see what great things God can do with losers and failures? If you ever think of yourself as being a loser or a failure or someone that is so insignificant, uh, I don't matter to anyone and such like that, you matter to God. You matter greatly to your God. You are not a loser. You are not a failure. Some of the greatest inventions and gains and whatever you want to say in life come out of failures. A failed idea, a failed project gives birth to something different that develops into something very important and very needed. And so also, I only speak for my, my friends in the ministry. I won't, I won't put a blanket over all the pastors. I don't know of any pastor who doesn't think of himself as a failure from time to time. I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that. I don't do this very well. I don't do that very well. And um, you know, I, just, I, just, I just fail. And yet every pastor I know deals with that and puts it behind them and trusts in the Lord that the Lord has a better plan for them and more important work for them to do. And then they go about their work. And for the Lord, much is achieved. You may sit, here I am, 40 years into my life, or 50 years into my life, and what do I have to show for it, and so on and so forth. Well, Moses could have said, I've got 80 years, and what do I have to show for it? 40 years in Midian. And then when God has work for him to do, he didn't want to do it. Ah, can't use me. I'm not going to be any good at it. Yes, I've chosen you because I have prepared you for 80 years. I have prepared you for this day. I have prepared you for this moment. I have prepared you for this time. And the same thing God says to us. I do not know, I don't have a clue as what God is preparing you for. But I know he has plans for you. And I know he can use you. 
And I know you never have to say about yourself, I'm of no use, or I can't do anything, or I'm not as good as them, or that, or whatever. Moses thought that too. But God had plans for him. And because God had plans for him, God's will was done in God's time. Now Moses was ready to do what God wanted him to do. And now the people would be ready for that deliverance that God would give them. And they would realize that it wasn't because Moses had a position of authority in the Egyptian courts. Through the miracles, the plagues, and such like that that God performed, they realized that their deliverance was solely in the hands of their God. It was solely according to His will. Just as for you and I, our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, our life, and our, our certain hope of heaven is not based on anything we do, but it's entirely based on what God has done for us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lived and died for our sin, and to pay for our sins, and assure us that, having been forgiven, we have peace with God, and we have the sure hope of eternal life with Him in heaven. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus, unto life everlasting. Amen. We join the Christian church as we... Confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in the words of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and in his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The offertory will now be played, followed by the singing of hymn 750. O Jesus, innocent Lamb of God, who, is volunt who volunteered to be cursed, punished, and even forsaken by God in our place, look upon us with mercy 
and hear our prayers as we meditate upon your bitter suffering and death. Bring to your people's minds a vivid way the agony of body and soul that you suffered for our sake and the spiritual anguish you felt while bearing the burden of our guilt. Draw us in spirit back in time to witness the blood flowing from your, from your holy wounds and open our hearts to the realization that it flows for us. Move us by your love and tender mercy to bring our sins to you for pardon. As we consider the sacrifice you made in our behalf, help us crucify our flesh with all its wickedness through the example of your perfect obedience to the commands. Dear Savior, draw us to you, just as on the cross you won the dying malefactor. Remind us of our forgiveness. Remove from our hearts any bitter feelings that we have toward others. Let us cling to your cross in faith. And may our comfort be in our last hour that your death has caused us to have no terror of our own. We ask this in Jesus' name. And we rejoice with Anna and Tyler Lanfear. They had a baby girl on Wednesday. Anna is the daughter of Roger and Mary Gutch and the granddaughter of Shirley Hynek. We pray. Thank you, Father, for the gift of life and for your power and promises that preserve life. We thank you more for having sent Jesus to adopt this child into your family and for sending the Holy Spirit that through the waters of baptism she'll be made your child. Make your church a fellowship of encouragement and admonition to foster growth and guidance for her. We ask this in Jesus' name, who welcomes little children. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We continue with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame came us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, help be thy name. Our 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Just do as often as you eat in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, All of you drink from it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Just do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take of his body and blood, be one body, unite in their faith, both in confession and word and deed. We ask that only those who are members join us at the Lord's table. Thank you.
body which has been given for you and his holy precious blood which he shed to end the forgiveness of all your sins. He has
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given to death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Now may his body, which has been given for you, and his holy, precious blood, which he shed for you the forgiveness of all your sins, may it strengthen and keep you in the true faith in Christ Jesus, and the life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. That we pray, we pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our closing hymn, hymn 928, May the Grace of Christ our Savior.
once again, good morning. Wonderful to have all of you here this morning. Wonderful to have you at home with us as well this morning. I'll just highlight a few things on the back of your service folder, Monday, Thursday, and Easter. Uh, Sign-up sheets in the back, just so they know, have an idea about how many to prepare for and such for those meals. And then at the bottom of the page, the Easter lilies this year are 16. If someone would like to donate a, an, an Easter lily for the season, please please feel free to do that and talk to Rosemary or to Sandy about that. Um, this week, the pastor's at their home churches for the midweek Lent service. I'll be here, so it'll be the fourth midweek service this week, so please join us for that worship service. This week, I'll meet with the confirmands only going forward now, and on Wednesday, we'll meet at 5.30, so parents, please note on, for the catechism at 5.30 on Wednesday. I think that's all I have, and Sandy has asked to address the congregation. On Saturday, April 6th, Grayson is going to host our LWMS Spring Rally. And the churches that are involved are Lincoln Heights in Des Moines, West Des Moines Beautiful Savior, and Good Shepherd in Cedar Rapids, and then Grace. And what we, what we do is we have um, an opening devotion, then we have a presentation, we have lunch, we have a short business meeting, and then we have a closing devotion. And the person that we have um, secured to speak to us is Christian Christensen, and he's from Minnesota, right? No, no, it's, no? It's the Northwest Wisconsin. Okay, sorry, Northwest Wisconsin, and he is going to come and talk to us about the Lord uses each of us to grow His kingdom, and it's lessons learned um, as a synod mission enhancement congregation. So he is going to come on Saturday and be our speaker, as well as he's going to lead us at, or, or co-lead us on Sunday, then April 7th. I have a sign-up sheet since we are going to be providing lunch. And in December, um, our ladies aid, we decided that we would have soups, sliders, little sandwiches, salads, and desserts. So if you can help out in any way, that would be marvelous. And I will also um, have pastors send out the daily, the, the times. So like from 9 o'clock to 9.30 is our registration. Um, 9.30 to 10 is opening devotion. 10 to 11.30 is the presentation, then lunch, the business meeting about 12.15. And then we have about closing devotion. So it's usually over by 1.30 or 2. So it's not all of the day, but it's that portion right in the middle. But if you can help out, I will put this probably back on the second table since we have so many sign-ups going on. But I appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you. Mic box on the back table for donations for missions. I don't think they use the mite boxes anymore. Um, I'm not sure what happened with that, but now they have the offerings that are taken. And then the fall rally and the spring rally, they have the offerings that are taken, and those get sent in, and they're divided up between home and world missions um, when they have their annual national convention each summer, which they have coming up in Sioux Falls this summer. If you'd be interested in going, please consider doing that. It's always a very good experience going to that national. Yes. Yes, I was going to get to that in just a minute here. I, um, a, a big change with regard to our Easter for Kids, it came to our attention that a number of conflicts on next Sunday. So we're moving Easter for Kids to the 17th. It won't be next Sunday the 10th. It'll be on the 17th of March. So please, please note that, parents. And, and when it's Easter for Kids, that doesn't mean just kids. So everyone is welcome to join for the for the festivity, for the food, and, and all the things that are going on. So we'd love to have you for that. So I will call the children up at this time. Okay. Okay. When these things come out, what, what does that mean? Cleaning time. It's come to my attention that you guys aren't very good cleaners, so we're going to practice this morning for a little while, right? You're ready to go? Yeah. 
at, at spring clean when we get out there and get at all those things and such like that. Uh, there was an episode in the Bible where Jesus did a little cleaning when he was a clean in the temple because some people were doing things in the temple that they really shouldn't have been doing there in the temple. They were cheating people, selling things for overpriced. They were making the temple atmosphere into like a flea market, a bazaar, um, and it was, it was terrible. And Jesus comes in, he has some cords there, and he makes into a whip, and he turns over the tables, and he drives them out, and he cleans his, his, his church out because he says, you have made the Father's house into a den of thieves. It's no longer a house of prayer. And that certainly is a concern that we have, too, that we keep, that we keep the, the sanctity, the holiness of God's house, and that we worship him in spirit and in truth and, and such. And so we do those things that would edify and encourage people. But also individually. Is there any house cleaning that needs to be done within each of us? Do we always have good thoughts about other people? Do we always say good things about other people? Do we always say, yes, mother, father, I will do that right now. I'll stop everything I'm doing and just get at it right now. Or do we whine and complain and mope about and it's like just terrible parents making us do all these things? Actually, God needs to do a lot of cleaning within us as well. And that's just what he did by giving his son to pay for all of our sins and to pay for all those sins of neglect and anger and jealousy and rage and all those types of things. He cleaned up our lives. And we have the holiness that Jesus has given to us that comes to us through faith. And we thank the Lord that he takes all those bad things and he paid for them and he went to the cross to do just that. So as we think of spring cleaning, um, I realize I've got a lot of dirt in me too the dirt of sin. Lord, come, cleanse me, cleanse me, make me clean again. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that we don't always do the things that we should. We don't always say the things we should. And that we sometimes get angry, and sometimes we're not very obedient. Lord, forgive us for those times and help us to do all the things that you would want us to be doing. We thank the work of the teachers who prepared a lesson for us this morning. Thank you, Lord, as they teach us about you. They bring us to know you a little bit better, and we thank you for them and for the work that they do. Now bless us as we hear your word and study it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'll start over here. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. There we go, obstacle course here, there we go, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. And Lord bless you with a good and safe week. Thank you.